Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this lecture on consciousness. I'm sharing the screen to start the recording. Um, uh, and yes, so this is uh, the third uh, lecture in a series of uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience lectures uh, available to everybody. Uh, who are interested uh, via YouTube. Uh, and I hope that uh, there will be many. This is sort of an experiment. Uh, so I've been uh, lecturing uh, uh, for a number of uh, years on this topic. Um, and now I uh, just decided to uh, make this available to everybody interested. Of course, this is not really the exactly the same version as I've been uh, lecturing uh, before, uh, but um, uh, anyways, the, the, um, uh, uh, it's, it's still uh, uh, has the same uh, basic concepts that I try to relate to you. And okay, so consciousness is a very interesting, very challenging topic. And um, some years ago, uh, as I was uh, preparing uh, for the lecture on consciousness, uh, I found this really, really great article uh, on the neural basis of consciousness written by Chris Fritt. And I really strongly recommend uh, that uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, so then uh, please uh, uh, check this article. Um, and, and read it in addition to uh, listening to this uh, lecture. And Chris Frint is, is basically making uh, several points that I will then uh, summarize in the following. Basically, he's uh, saying that it has evolved as a feature of all animals with sufficiently complex nervous system, but of course it, it comes with different levels uh, and uh, 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 the, the, the consciousness in different animals is, of course, of a uh, different uh, type. Uh, so, but to uh, go into the subject matter. Um, so first, we can think of consciousness as subjective experiences. So uh, Chris Fried makes the point the standard definition of being conscious is having subjective experiences. And, and, and in the um, clearest case, this is comparing the awake person to the, that in coma. And, and then one can, of course, ask the question of which neural systems differentiate being conscious from being in coma. And then we can uh, gain some understanding of, okay, so which neural systems are important uh, for this. Um, also, it's true that a person can learn to perform overlearned behaviors without being conscious. <clears throat> For example, as you're driving a car or riding a bicycle, uh, there's a, a whole lot of things you're, you're, you're not paying conscious attention to. Uh, and, and you're just interrupted uh, from your thoughts uh, on, on uh, some points. Um, uh, for example, uh, if there's some obstacle uh, on, on the route, uh, uh, and, and so forth. And then overland performance can even deteriorate with the involvement of consciousness. So if you're doing some learned behavior quite well and smoothly, and, and then uh, you're uh, you know, asked to do it in front of others, and you pay particular attention of, of how you know, the sequence of movements goes, you know, it, it might be that uh, this is not going as well as normally. Uh, and uh, uh, so then the, the question of what then happens in the brain when one is, is conscious of something. And uh, speaking of uh, experimental tasks, uh, there's this example of binocular, binocular rivalry uh, where this can be studied. Uh, so presenting one image to one eye and another image to another eye, uh, then uh, uh, one can have this, this uh, alternating uh, percepts, and then one can uh, track 
uh, neural activity as a function of what is being perceived, even though the input uh, stays the same. And there are some, some visual cortical correlates uh, of this that have been described. Uh, so this, this brings uh, one important uh, principle uh, to the fore. Uh, sensory cortices are involved in, in consciousness and also uh, during uh, imagery, mental or auditory imagery, uh, it seems that uh, there is involvement of sensory uh, um, uh, cortices. So binocular rivalry, presenting two different pictures, for example, a face and a house, to left and right eye results in the conscious percept alternating between the two. Um, and the experimental subjects then, for example, press two buttons when the percept changes between the face and the house. The brain activity recorded during such percepts indicate that during the percept of face, fusiform face area exhibits activity during the percept of house, the hippocampal place area exhibits uh, activity. Uh, and then there's also some uh, visual cortical uh, correlates of this, some differential activity there. Uh, there's this YouTube link, uh, which is um, uh, not really on this uh, binocular rivalry per se, but, but it's describing some cases where presenting different information to different eyes. Uh, uh, one can um, sort of introduce uh, uh, the brain, uh, 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 some, some uh, uh, information, uh, which, which however is, is not being consciously perceived, but still we can make guesses uh, based on this information. So it's a very interesting uh, video. I strongly recommend uh, this, uh, viewing this video. As, as part of the learning. Um, and then uh, something that uh, Fritz uh, brings up is brain activity uh, uh, matches the, the uh, contents of uh, consciousness. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is also a very important uh, observation. Um, so a coma patient unable to move, but with some consciousness can imagine a movement upon request and the associated brain activity is then detected. So, I mean, this can, this is a method that can be used to determine the depth of uh, coma. Uh, so even if the patient cannot uh, in any way indicate uh, externally uh, uh, that uh, he has some uh, consciousness, uh, we can use uh, brain imaging methods to uh, to help uh, determine that, uh, well, yes, uh, there is some consciousness. Um, then one um, way to look at levels of consciousness uh, is to look at um, uh, different uh, uh, degrees of comatose uh, patients. So uh, coma proper, the patient is entirely non-responsive. Uh, uh, then there's another state where the patient goes through a sleep-wake cycle uh, in EEG, but uh, there are no other signs of awareness. Uh, minimally conscious state, uh, some responsiveness to stimuli at times follows simple commands. Um, and then something which has been uh, shown is that consciousness is absent when the cortical metabolic activity, especially the frontal and parietal areas, is less than 40% of normal. So there's some kind of a rule of thumb that Frick uh, brings forward. Um, and then loss of connectivity between brain races is another hallmark sign that goes hand in hand with consciousness levels, especially thalamocortical, front parietal, and top down uh, connectivity. Uh, these are the essential uh, uh, aspects of connectivity that seem to uh, relate to uh, consciousness. Um, then uh, Chris Fritt, uh, in his review, goes through uh, theories of consciousness, uh, and there's this integrated information theory, uh, which is conscious experience requires integration of information across brain regions. So, I mean, this obviously is the case. Connectivity is involved. Uh, then there's uh, this recurrent processing theory uh, that says conscious perceptual experience arises via recurrent top-down connectivity processing in sensory areas. 
this the global neuronal workspace uh, consciousness uh, theory where consciousness may not be equal to all content in working memory but needed for its manipulation um, and then the importance of front parietal connectivity lends support for this so this uh, global neuronal workspace uh, may be uh, sort of the best uh, guess at the moment of uh, being maybe the leading uh, theory of uh, consciousness but all this um different ones they, they sort of, you know capture some of the some of the uh, truth um and then the high order theories uh, according to which uh, what is required uh, high order representation of mental states involving frontal cortex i mean you can see connectivity frontal cortex parietal cortex uh, uh thalamocortical connectivity uh, so so these uh, uh, are uh, the uh, uh, things required uh, for for our consciousness to operate. Then something uh, of an importance uh, is are these altered states of consciousness. Uh, these can occur in patients with memory problems, uh, and 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 for example, there are patients with hippocampal damage uh, who have this uh, problem of not consolidating their memories. And, and they uh, describe uh, experiences uh, like I have just woken up, I cannot imagine the future, I'm like swimming in the body of endless water. Also, uh, in cases of dementia, patients uh, might uh, complain of such. It, I put here a YouTube link, I, I recommend uh, warmly that you watch, it's a very short one, uh, it describes uh, a patient case who has uh, this kind of uh, memory problem. Uh, also, uh, there are some drugs that uh, alter uh, consciousness. Uh, and, and here you can see an example of, uh, of a tool, a self-report tool that can be used in such uh, studies uh, where the um, uh, low dose of this uh, drug uh, alters certain uh, aspects uh, of conscious experience. A high dose alters them more, so that when you get a dose response, uh, for example, uh, there's, there's more imagery, uh, uh, mixing of audiovisual uh, stimulation, uh, change meaning of percepts. Um, but for example, for spiritual uh, experiences or feeling a blissful state, uh, there uh, doesn't seem to be a dose response. So even the low dose. Now this drug was sufficient to, to alter. I mean, not the spiritual experiences didn't really, uh, you know, comfort uh, uh, much and then this embodiment. But you can see these different examples of how the consciousness can be altered. And, and here is a behavioral tool that can be used uh, as a self-report uh, 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 research uh, uh, method. Then something we know from electrical stimulation studies. Electrical stimulation of specific brain areas elicits conscious experiences that are in line with the known functionality of the area. Uh, for example, stimulation of area MT uh, produces sensations of visual motion. Uh, Fusiform face area uh, produces uh, perceptions of faces. Uh, auditory cortex uh, stimulation uh, produces voices or sounds, emotional brain areas, uh, such as amygdala and insula, produce emotional sensations, and some other sensory cortex uh, stimulation produces sensations of touch. Um, and, and, and these um, findings uh, sort of tie the sensory areas uh, as important for, for these types of uh, conscious experiences. But, but uh, this is not sufficient in and by itself. Uh, it seems connectivity with parietal and frontal cortical areas is needed for conscious experiences. So activity in the sensory cortices alone seems to be necessary, but not sufficient uh, for, for, for these, these kinds of uh, uh, stimulations. Uh, and then there's the, the, the question of binding uh, and, and binding in working memory. So working memory is not to be dependent on the front parietal connectivity. 
working memory chunks information. For example, activating concept of a cat usually activates multidimensional representations of the cat. This might underlie the, the finding of different sensory experiences in the whole unified conscious experience. Um, and then there's the limited capacity of consciousness. So only part of working memory content uh, can be uh, uh, the, the conscious experience uh, at any given uh, moment. But so then the the uh, other concurrent uh, working memory content uh, uh, sort of close to threshold uh, to become uh, a conscious uh, experience. Uh, Yet another uh, issue is conceptualization and conscious interpretation uh, of the world. Uh, we all the time, you know, conceptualize, we categorize, uh, and 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 this uh, makes it uh, possible for us to comprehend this this very uh, complex world. And then at the same time, uh, this is very resistant way of coding. Okay, so there are these things and, and, and then paying constant attention to them. Um, so the, the, the conscious contents of the mind uh, uh, very much depend on which semantic concepts are concurrently activated in the brain. Uh, and, and, and here there's some really interesting neuroimaging findings uh, indicating that semantic concepts style the human cortex. So uh, the whole cortex is involved in representing you know, quite focally uh, different semantic uh, concepts. And, and also it's true that uh, concepts nearby in semantic space are also nearby in cortical space. And, and this might uh, explain why, uh, you know, one, one aspect of our, our associative memory uh, functions. Um, you can learn more about this uh, findings of semantic concepts, concepts styling the brain, uh, published in Nature in 2016, uh, from these uh, uh, two videos. There's the uh, YouTube video for, for first um, <clears throat> that describes these results uh, quite nicely, and and then you can also via the the lower link. Uh, you can go on and browse uh, the brain and see which kinds of concepts are located in, in which kinds of places. Uh, <clears throat> something, uh, something that uh, uh, is very crucial to understand uh, uh, in, in terms of how uh, the uh, brain represents information uh, our findings indicating that there are distributed patterns of activity and inhibition in neural populations, and this gives rise to representations to memory traces. And here I uh, present this uh, quite fundamental uh, set of findings uh, from uh, uh, Cox and Savoy, published in Neuroimage over in 2003. Uh, they uh, presented different visual objects, uh, baskets, birds, chairs, you know, different types of chairs and birds and so on from different angles. And um, uh, then what they noticed is that uh, they take a lateral occipital complex, which is a sort of object area of the brain, uh, and, and then they order these voxels. Uh, and, and see, uh, you know, so uh, voxel number, say 100, has activity level this much, 99 this much, and so on and so forth. And, and what they're seeing is that there's this signature pattern that replicates whenever there's a chair. Uh, it, this is well above chance level. So, I mean, whenever there's a bird, there are certain voxels that are active. Uh, in, in respect to, you know, from which angle, which uh, bird uh, is, is viewed, uh, there's something common to all birds. There's this distributed pattern of uh, voxels that uh, activate. And, and actually, this, this kinds of distributed uh, sparse uh, representations, they are very effective uh, in, in representing information. So you can imagine that if you have uh, 1,000 neurons and you would assign one year neuron to each object in this world, you could represent 1,000 objects. Uh, but if you uh, start um, 
implying that okay, so you, you take uh, 15 neurons and, and the joint activation of these 15 neurons represent uh, one uh, specific object. And then it's the joint activity of, of, of constellation, another constellation of a little bit different set of uh, 15 neurons co-activating. Uh, and, and, and suddenly, uh, and you don't have to stick with the 15, but anyways, you know, a fairly small number, it seems. And then you can suddenly represent uh, just multiple, multiple things uh, uh, with, with only 1,000 neurons. Um, and then uh, something I have uh, touched upon in my previous uh, lectures, uh, I really like theoretical uh, work by uh, Moshe Bar. Uh, here's uh, uh, something from uh, his article in 2009. Uh, <clears throat> and, and this uh, very much also relates to the consciousness uh, saying that the human brain is proactive and it continuously generates predictions that anticipate the relevant future. And, and this is done so that analogies are derived from elementary information that is extracted rapidly from the input to link that input with the representation that exists in the memory. So this is how consciousness is, is kind of built. And this generates focused predictions by associative activation of representations that are relevant to this analogy. In the case, I mean, we don't become conscious of all this. Uh, a lot of this is uh, background processing, uh, but still, you know, this is this is how the contents of uh, uh, consciousness uh, are predicted, uh, uh, are generated. And and of course, so this also depends on what kind of goals we have that we're pursuing. You know, what do we pay attention to? Um, uh, and, and then this looping system uh, kind of works with that. Um, predictions in complex circumstances such as social interactions combine multiple analogies in, in uh, Barr's theory. Um, uh, and, and this is backed up by uh, some findings that uh, more complex scripts in other studies have been mapped to increasingly anterior prefrontal cortical areas. Uh, and these predictions need not to be created afresh than in new situations, but rather re we rely on existing scripts of memory. Uh, and uh, what is important, these scripts are the result of real as well as previously imagined experiences. Uh, it, 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 it seems that the medial structures of the default mode network along with the hippocampus are important for this. So what happens, our brain constantly runs scenarios of possible future events and stores these for future. Um, uh, and so, uh, in this sense, uh, you know, when we're at rest, our brain all the time works and and, and tries to, to generate uh, sort of scenarios that help us deal with uh, some some future uh, situations. It's very interesting. And here, uh, you can see an overlap of the contextual association network with the default mode networks, the overlap is indicated with red color. So the medial prefrontal cortical areas, medial parietal areas, and medial temporal areas, which includes the hippocampus. Uh, and also this uh, finding relates to uh, this, what I touched upon in the lecture on social cognition. So we have this uh, phenomenon resting state or default mode network uh, where it's seen that activity is higher during rest than simple tasks. And then watching social interactions, uh, there's a higher default mode uh, network activity than during rest. So maybe what the default mode network is doing uh, is when we're in the uh, fMRI scanner and we don't have any tasks, we're social daydreaming. And, and then this is why the uh, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, precuneus, other areas start to work together. Um, and, and, and this nicely goes uh, together with the uh, theory of uh, Nosebar. <clears throat> okay, and so then uh, psychological constructionist uh, view and emotions is, is something that also relates to uh, consciousness. I mean, in some ways, emotion and consciousness uh, can be seen as, as a continuum or linked uh, process. There's also some literature uh, on this. 
So in addition to semantic concepts that, uh, you know, maybe watch the YouTube video or tiling the brain, uh, uh, the contents of consciousness uh, additionally include conscious interpretations of emotional reactions and states. Uh, so in this constructionist view of emotions, emotions emerge when people make meaning out of sensory input from the body and from the world using knowledge of prior experiences. So in this sense, emotions are situated conceptualizations because the emerging meaning is tailored to the immediate environment and prepares the person to respond to sensory input in a way that is tailored to the situation. Um, uh, just as in perception, quick initial guesses that shape further assessment of the situation can be overturned if there's a clear mismatch. Uh, we sort of conceptualize uh, these emotions as well. I mean, we, we get this bodily response and and then uh, you know we we might uh, you know think it's because of uh, uh, of some danger, but uh, then then we know this oh there's there's no danger, and then we calm down. And and so then uh, in their theory they they ponder on what are the most primitive operations that make up emotions and cognition, and and this is not currently known precisely, but there are some hypotheses. Yeah, so there's this idea that there's core effect, uh, science of arousal from the body, uh, and and uh, and then this uh, plays with conceptualization. So by a concept conceptualization, core effect is automatically interpreted and attributed to some event. Uh, for example, arousal when we're watching some sports match, uh, we we attribute this to sports event. Uh, 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 or, or you know, if we uh, you know fail to remember something, we attribute to uh, our household to oh, gosh, I can't remember anything. Or I me, mean, sometimes when giving a lecture, and you know, you, you know, uh, one gets aroused and and cannot remember, you know, what was uh, that one was supposed to to to, to say next. Uh, you know, then there's the clear attribution, or or some objects, you know, like uh, that person is so lovely. But uh, uh, oftentimes also there can be uh, emotional states and we don't really kind of know, you know, why, why are we feeling like this? Um, and uh, also uh, we uh, 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 make uh, conceptualizations that uh, are not, not really uh, correct. And so here you can see a, a schematic illustration uh, from this uh, uh, Quite nice review uh, a paper by Linquist uh, and colleagues, uh, where the core effect, conceptualization, language, and executive um, areas are located uh, in, in, in the brain in, in different uh, uh, color coding. And, and then, of course, these, these different uh, uh, areas or, or functions are, are important uh, for, uh, for uh, emotions. Uh, executive uh, for emotion regulation, core effect conceptualization, I already explained. And then, and of course, language is something which is uh, um, very much related to the conceptualization. Um, and so, uh, furthermore, signals from the body, the core effect, the information from outside the body and representations of prior experiences sort of you know, guide this conceptualization. And, and it's this model emotion words, uh, which is the conceptualization service anchors that help categorize the core effect with contextual appraisal to discrete emotions, uh, anger or fear, and then further help shape the experience by guiding perception goals and activation of relevant memory materials. So this is a very dynamic system. Um, uh, and, and then, uh, uh, also, uh, we're seeing that uh, categorization of the form of situated conceptualization is realized in a set of brain races that reconstitutes prior experiences for the use in presence. So this is default mode network again. And, and also we have empirical uh, findings showing that midline default mode network structures are crucial in emotional experiences. And, and this particular study published in Cerebral Cortex 2016 uh, this analysis was timed so that 
uh, th this was really the temporally the last lingering activity. So once the conceptualization has been done, so this is how it sees, uh, seems like. Uh, and, and you can see how these different uh, discrete emotions, they, they really have this, this very um, much overlapping, but still separate uh, distributed patterns of uh, brain activity. Um, that you know, that they constitute kind of signature patterns of these specific emotions uh, in, in a situation where a person uh, has sort of a lingering clear uh, uh, emotion. But also, it's important to realize that uh, there are these group-based or social emotions. Uh, and here it's important to appreciate that uh, our self-concept is very much social. Uh, so there are these social group-based emotions uh, that link emotions with social cognition and social neuroscience. Uh, group memberships uh, constitute uh, additional inputs to the conceptualization of emotions. And important values and goals of the groups motivate and cause emotions in individuals. Group narratives and norms shape conceptualization of events and information. Love and a mean group, political hatred. Uh, these are good examples of uh, group-based or social emotions. And what is really important here, uh, this, this variability across individuals as to the strength of uh, particular group-based emotions, uh, social identification largely determines the strength of the influence of a given group. The higher the so social identification, uh, the, the, the the stronger uh, the influence of the group norms and emotions on the individual. There's something um, something uh, rather different. Um, uh, this slide is titled "Quite Provocatively" and. Um, trying to provoke you uh, is there free will and 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 why is this how has this come under question uh, and and here you can see a um, um, paper uh, from 1983 uh, on, on so-called readiness potential uh, uh, and uh, uh, here in this paper, they they describe uh, the recordable cerebral activity, which is readiness potential, that precedes a freely voluntary, fully endogenous motor act, uh, was directly compared with reportable time for appearance of the subjective experience of wanting or intending to act. And that was, was important. The onset of cerebral activity clearly preceded by at least several hundred milliseconds to report a time of conscious intention to act. This relationship held even for those series uh, in which subjects reported that all of the four self report initiated movements in the series appeared spontaneously. Uh, okay, so there's some activity in the brain that precedes our conscious experience. Now I want to do this action. Uh, so do we have free will or is it, is it something, you know, just that we think that we have free will? Um, okay, this is a little bit provocative now. Uh, and so how was it this done? So uh, subjects were asked to note the position of a rapidly rotating knot and clock uh, at the moment of becoming aware of the decision to move a finger. In brain activity, uh, precedes uh, conscious intent to act by about 200 milliseconds. Um, there's some 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 further uh, studies showing to um, uh, on this, but uh, it, it was noted uh, the the brain subconsciously plans for the movement, but allows for conscious veto to act or withhold an action. And so there's also the possibility of readiness potential uh, without uh, without any action. And so this is already a little bit marks the water of uh, you know is there free will, but so uh, this has sort of resulted in philosophical uh, debate 
So early days in Western philosophy, it was assumed that laws of causation explain events and actions. And so the world was deterministic. Uh, and, and so this is in contrast to the concept of what is morally right and responsible that require free will. Uh, so that we can choose at any time action B instead of action A. Uh, and, and so this conflict is called the free will problem. Uh, so and 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 then you know one can ask the question: Can anyone be held accountable for their actions if there's no free will? Uh, uh, and 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 so, <clears throat> of course, uh, this this is not really a terribly wise question because uh, if nobody was held accountable for their actions, uh, then this would actually influence deterministic system uh, in devious ways. Uh, so. Um, uh, but you know, as a philosophical uh, debate, I, I understand the intrigue. And so, free will a question found its way into experimental psychology with the pioneering findings of uh, readiness potential that uh, we we saw. But there have been some subsequent studies, for example, uh, in, in this experimental uh, setup. Uh, uh, they looked at, at uh, are there some patterns of uh, brain activity and where in the brain that would precede uh, the uh, conscious uh, moment of, okay, I, I imagined uh, vertical gratings or, or uh, 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 horizontal ones, uh, you know, in this kind of task where the subjects are to, to either. And so, uh, up to 11 seconds uh, before before uh, the sort of conscious awareness, uh, there's some patterned activity in the occipital and frontal areas uh, that uh, 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 predict uh, uh, what will the subjects choose to to uh, to imagine, uh, and, and this is very very uh, interesting. And and then these findings have been. Um, uh, extended to, to some uh, other um, uh, areas. Uh, for example, uh, you can find and study this article, uh, pre-existing pre brain stains predict risky choices, uh, where the results indicated that activities in the left nucleus accumbens and medial frontal gyrus can bias subsequent risky decision making. And of course, so um, sort of underscores that uh, we're not uh, uh, aware of all the determinants that uh, you know guide our, our, our choices and behavior. Um, uh, but so, um, uh, I also uh, found this very nice article uh, in 2014. Uh, you can see the reference uh, below uh, that basically uh, placed this uh, debate uh, into context. So this, you know, just quoting from this article, these studies demonstrate the role of unconscious processes and simple free choices, but they do not inform the philosophical debate really. Sequential sampling models, which assume accumulation of evidence towards decision threshold, can also be applied to free decisions. And, and there's some indication. So um, uh, there was this one study where they looked at whether there's a, a pattern that, that precedes the, the, the moment of, of becoming conscious, I want to do this or make this choice. And, and this uh, accuracy really peaked at the moment of this uh, volition. Uh, and, and so, I mean, this would sort of go with this uh, line of thought. Uh, and, and then they further uh, say investigation of neural activity patterns associated with free decisions should aim to investigate how decisions are jointly a function of internal and external contexts rather than to resolve the philosophical free will debate. Uh, okay, and uh, then there, there are some, uh, some concepts that I will touch uh, briefly, you know, uh, uh, as I begin uh, to approach the conclusion of uh, this uh, online lecture. Uh, so meta-consciousness. 
uh, this is self-awareness of thinking about myself thinking. And, and it seems interesting with that lesion uh, and, and gray matter density neuroimaging studies have su suggested frontal pole and area 10 and Rodman and precunius is the most central regions for metaconsciousness. Uh, and, and okay, so uh, this uh, medial prefrontal uh, uh, and precunius uh, and, and so the frontal pole uh, is, is part of the medial prefrontal. So, so again, these, these regions, this is prefrontal and, and, and parietal regions uh, come up as, as important uh, for uh, for consciousness, as in Chris Fritz's uh, article. Uh, so committing errors in performance often prompt for metaconsciousness where singular cortical areas are important. Single anterior singular cortex is thought to be a structure which is involved in the processing of, of you know, these sort of conflicting uh, situations. We intended to do something, but did something else, or you know, these two uh, sensory inputs, for example, might tell different tales, uh, yeah. And so uh, also various self-reflection tasks drive uh, medial prefrontal cortex and precunius uh, and, and uh, involvement of autobiographical memory additional in closed hippocampus. Um, then anterior insula in turn is involved in bodily self-experience, uh, which sort of uh, expands the, the the role of anterior insula from being uh, 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 area that is activated when we feel disgusted. Uh, maybe the feeling of disgust is, is something that has a lot of bodily experiences to it. Uh, and, and this is why we're seeing anterior insula activation when we uh, show experimental subjects, uh, for example, pictures that elicit feelings of uh, disgust. And okay, so then there's a video I recommend you to watch, Evolution of Consciousness. Uh, and, and there are these uh, mirror self-recognition uh, experiments. Um, uh, uh, and you can see uh, some video footage uh, in this video uh, of how orangutans um, uh, pass this, uh, this test. You know, it's, it's always good to see sort of primary data like this, if possible, uh, rather than taking it for granted uh, by reading a neuroscience book that uh, orangutans pass this test. Uh, it's good to see it. And, and you know, then you can sort of have a, an assessment. So as conclusions, um, the empirical work has started to unravel the neural basis of consciousness. Uh, front parietal areas and their connectivity with sensory regions of the brain seem to support conscious sensory experiences. Activation of semantic concepts and conceptualization of emotional experiences are ingredients of the contents of consciousness. Additional insulin and singular cortex are needed for metaconsciousness ability, which is thinking about thinking. And then uh, uh, in, in terms of evolution of consciousness, uh, metaconsciousness is an example of something which uh, is believed to be most recent in development of uh, species. All right, so I hope that uh, this uh, lecture uh, was uh, uh, informative, entertaining, uh, inspiring for you, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, building uh, more lectures uh, uh, to you too.